Hey, what's up, Liron here, and in this video, following a request, I'm gonna show you how to paint water and water droplets in watercolor. I'm gonna show you two ways. One of them is uh, water drops resting on some kind of a surface, and another one is a looser, freer, kind of flying through the air position, okay? So without further ado, let's take it to the table and get started. So here we go with the first demonstration, these uh, three drops on the floor. Uh, I really like this one because you can really feel their uh, volume the volume of the drops thanks to the unique light and shadow conditions, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, now, the photo was originally much larger and also in color. I turned it black and white. Now, I could not find a good section where there's a nice composition of the drops, um, but I decided to just change it up. Uh, so what I did was move one of the drops a little uh, lower and to the right. Uh, and what this creates is more of a triangular composition. You could go anyway, there aren't any harsh compositional rules, really everything can be broken pretty much. Um, but I did want to uh, go at it this way. Now I'm marking the spots for the highlights. This is the most important thing because what I'm gonna do is both use masking, uh, masking fluid and also uh, I will skip the highlights manually. I will paint around them. This is really important. Uh, the the parts that you see me mark uh, are gonna be the paper white. Okay, uh, so you get this beautiful large highlight on the bottom left section of the of the drop, and then you get these smaller dots. Okay, um, and one of the things that you'll find challenging maybe in watercolor, especially when getting started, is getting the um, negative painting down where you are aware of what's where. Uh, it's very hard to actually navigate the painting very often when you're just getting started. With time you get a sense for it and you learn how to more easily avoid the highlights. Um, a lot of it has to do with brush technique, using it efficiently and, and creating shapes very effectively with uh, fewer brush marks. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into that. Now let's talk a bit about the masking fluid. Uh, just because it's gonna be a little challenging to avoid these smaller tiny highlights, I decided to mask them. Now I will say this, and this keeps happening to me, uh, I can't get a small drop of masking fluid. Maybe I should use a smaller brush. That's probably the problem. I just can't, they always end up being a little too big. Uh, and what this does, it hurts the impression a bit. So from afar it will look good, but if you look up close at the finished result, which we'll see in just a few moments, uh, you'll notice how these uh, dots are a little too large and it, it hurts the impression just a bit. I mean, what we see here is basically a reflection of three lights from the ceiling or from somewhere around the dots. Um, now, I'm sorry that I didn't film properly, so it started filming only uh, midway through that initial wash. My apologies. I just mixed a large quantity of water, mainly gray and whatever I had on the palette. Uh, and you see I dropped a hair there. I think that's Ruth's hair, by the way. Uh, what I'm doing is going around that tr triangular highlight area, but then I'm blending the top edge near it. So I'm gonna show you in just a moment, okay? Painting carefully around that area, wetting the brush, cleaning it a bit, and blending that edge. Because one of these edges is a little more blurry and blended. The other one's a little sharper. And this contrast between the two edges is going to give this some interest. It's a very small painting, it's a very um, minimal, minimalistic painting, so these things do help to bring out whatever interest you can uh, in the painting uh, with very few means, so to speak. It's a very humble painting in a way. Uh, there isn't too much that goes into it, and funny enough, these are the best when you're getting started. Uh, nothing too complex, no, you know, even portraits can be good for that as long as the shapes are simple. Um, but nothing like, you know, large cityscapes and big shapes and lots of perspective. That's a little too complex uh, very often. So just a quick recommendation regarding that. And now I'm going to blend that edge out. One disadvantage of painting small is that uh, it's very hard to blend edges. You don't have enough wiggle room sometimes, so you have to be very efficient with it. Uh, now let's talk a bit about droplets and drops and water. What makes them look the way they are? So they have both a reflective quality and a inversion quality. Uh, what you see very often in water drops is the light and shadow conditions in the background are flipped, they're reversed. So for example, if the light comes from the top, what we see is the, the large highlight at the bottom of the drop, you see? Uh, so what, what water drops and all of that, they tend to reverse 
everything upside down. Um, you'll see this very uh, often in uh, dew on leaves, like morning dew, um, when you have th these beautiful uh, pictures of, of, a, of a, what do you call these? I forgot what I, I'm going to remember in just a moment and feel stupid. Um, the ladybugs. So you have these ladybugs and, and the beautiful drop of morning dew on the leaf and it reverses everything. You can ski see the sky down and the, the grass is up. Uh, and that's part of what gives these both the feeling of volume, so it makes them feel three-dimensional because it's light and shadow in essence, but also that feeling of water. Uh, and I'm trying to achieve that effect here. Now you won't get a full picture of the effect until we remove the masking fluid, obviously, but you will start seeing this connect. Now I did struggle a bit with blending the edges. I don't know why. Uh, I think actually it's because this piece of paper was like down here for a while. Uh, it was a small piece that I didn't have any use for until this video um, and sometimes it collects a bit dust so then you, you have to clean it a bit before like just with maybe a paper towel or something like this and it can sometimes not even be enough so maybe a bit of dust there. Um, the paper's surface didn't feel as nice as it usually does, uh, which is fine, you know, I still got the, the blending, it just wasn't as even as I wanted it to. Uh, and by the way, just today I filmed, at the day of recording this narration, I filmed a video for my How to Simplify course, uh, How to Simplify in Watercolor, and I got all of the smooth transitions exactly as I wanted them to. Uh, so I'm happy, I'm actually, I had a really good painting experience today. It's going to be one of my best lessons so far, so I think you'll enjoy it. Um, so in any case, yeah, the, now what we're going to do is uh, blend the edge of that cast shadow. It's a very gentle shadow, it's barely visible. Um, you don't have to get it perfect as long as you can tell that there's um, something there, like a shadow there that's good. Uh, and the most important thing is to have it in the lower left section, because that way it will contrast most strongly with the highlight we left. Okay, um, and after this part, the painting gets rather repetitive. Okay, you just do the same thing for the other drops. Uh, but the technique is interesting, so I do want to show you that. Uh, a big part of it is knowing just how dark you want the, the mix to be. Uh, and by the way, look at the background. You will notice some unevenness in it. Uh, a lot of it um, comes from the fact that I did not mix enough. So when you have a larger wash, you really want to over mix. What you want ideally is to never have to remix more of that same mixture. Because when you stop and start remixing, uh, it can cause some issues. Uh, you will get some uneven transitions. You'll come back with a bit too much water, a little too much pigment, and you'll get these uneven patches. One more thing I would say is maybe the background is a little too dark. But again, it's not, not the end of the world. And uh, once we remove that... Uh, masking fluid, you'll get a better impression of what I'm talking about. Um, so going over this shadow, adding a bit more color if I need to darken it, um, adding, re removing a bit if necessary, spreading it out using some uh, wetter washes. Uh, regarding softening edges, very often it's easier to pre-wet an area then put the paint there and let it spread out and get a blended edge that way as opposed to what I'm doing here, which is put the paint then come back with water and blend it. Okay, it's something I mentioned uh, quite a few times in the past, but just remember it. Sometimes it's easier to pre-wet, then put the paint on it, and it will blend naturally. Okay, and to control its direction, you have to uh, sometimes tilt the paper a bit. Maybe you have to play around with it, uh, but it's very often an easier way of doing that. Okay, uh, now I'm trying to fix the shape of that drop because I didn't get it to be rounded enough. Um, and hopefully when we zoom out also it will make more sense. I believe, I, I'm actually very pleased with this result. Uh, the next one also is, is really nice, you'll see. Uh, but these, the beauty about these, and just like the, the previous video I did with the Mercedes logo, uh, which was the prompt uh, that, that encouraged a few people to ask me this kind of a video, this quality of a reflective surface or a ref reflective kind of a thing comes very often from all of these weird shapes. Uh, and very often, especially if you're the person who paints it, it's going to be hard to see the picture clearly. You'll feel maybe like something is off or something doesn't work. Very often, it's our imagination in a way, uh, because we are so used to looking at these things as abstract shapes 
because we're so close to them, it's like the uh, proximity, what do you call it, like familiarity blindness. You become so familiar with the painting that suddenly it doesn't make as much sense or it doesn't look like the thing it should look. Very often, if you just go to sleep or something, wake up the next day, look at it, you're like, wow, that looks really good. And I even had strange experiences of taking pictures of my art. And because it's a picture and the framing is a little different, it would suddenly feel like a bit of a different work and I love it. So it's very strange in a way uh, how that works. But, you know, it, it's a part of um, learning to see your paintings more clearly. And if you see a lot of mistakes, that's good. It means you have a lot of things to fix, um, a lot of inaccuracies you need to work on. And it's good that you are, at the very least, locating these uh, things. So this is close to finish. I do think the top part there um, could be a little darker. Um, it could be just a little bit stronger, but I don't even know if, if it's that important. Uh, bottom section, while it's still wet, if you can put the paint there, it will blend uh, very evenly. And uh, while it's still wet, if you come back later, you'll get a dry brush effect, basically, or something with a very harsh edge, uh, like I'm getting now, by the way, because I'm, I'm not doing wet and wet anymore. It already dried. Um, and by the way, a lot of people ask me, like, when should I do wet and wet? When should I do wet and dry? It's basically a question of do you want to work something more well and get smooth edges or you're fine with it drying and adding on the next stage? With time, you'll start um, to gain a better understanding of when you want it to stay wet, when you want it to stay dry. So it's, it's a bit of a complex topic. I do hope to talk more about it uh, in the future. Wet and wet, wet and dry and so on. So now I'm just gonna rub off that um, masking fluid and you can see the highlights are a little too large. I don't like that fact as much. Uh, I would rather them be smaller. We can't really make them smaller now because it's, uh, it's already dry. Uh, so that's one thing to have in mind, either paint larger so that it looks smaller or use a smaller brush, which I probably should have done. Uh, but in any case, here is the final result without the tape. And in just a second, we're going to move on uh, to the next process that I think you'll find fascinating. Okay, so let's get to it. Now for this process, once again, if you remember uh, that other video with the Mercedes logo, then this will look a little more similar in a way. Because here we do have all of these beautiful abstract shapes and it's the key to this kind of a painting. Uh, and it's beautiful, you look at it, it's like a drop of water, it looks really nice. Uh, but you have to detach from that and look at all the smaller shapes. Now what I'm doing is just establishing this, um, these oval, oval shapes uh, to conform to that the shape of the circle in the center. There's a small drop there in between them. Should have spaced them out a little bit. My drawing isn't perfect here, uh, but the, the paint is gonna do most of the job and there's actually something really nice about it. Um, and if you notice the colors themselves, there is a bit of an interest there. So you get uh, both the blue and then you also get this uh, or brown, green, orange kind of thing, uh, which will actually create a lot of interest. So we do want to emphasize that for sure. Uh, and especially use uh, wet and wet whenever possible in the beginning. Now, so I'm just patching up some of the spiral shapes there. Uh, and once I'm ready, I'm starting to paint. Now, look at the painting. Essentially, there are two layers there. Let's ignore everything that's dark and try just to pretend it doesn't exist. Look at what we're left with. We're left with a very gradual transition from almost paper white or almost white to just a bit of a darker value. Again, ignore all of those round dark ripples. Just look at the white and very light, very light to, it's not even a mid value. It's honestly, it's very light. This is what I'm painting right now. Okay. I'm painting all of these shapes underneath the darker shapes. So I'm ignoring everything except the highlights. Obviously, if there's white, I'm going to leave it. And what you'll see me do is paint around the highlights. And once I establish enough of that beautiful background, I'll start lifting back some of these highlights that you see and putting back some dark uh, wet and wet for the rounded uh, shapes of the light ripples. Okay, we're not touching the dark shapes yet. And this is something you will be really beneficial for you to train yourself to see. Can you see the painting without the shadows? Just the underwash, just the thing you put under. Uh, and if you can, if you practice it enough, you'll get it. Now look at the colors. 
Here it switches from first top to bottom, it goes from muted and white onto a stronger blue, which I love. I love that it's a little stronger with the blue there. But then around the bottom, we get to this beautiful green, brown, orange. I'm going to use burnt sienna for that. Uh, and I'm establishing it slowly but surely. Okay, I have time. The paper is still wet. I actually sprayed some water on it to keep it wet for longer. And I'm just going to establish these gentle, uh, darker areas, okay? And they're very gentle and it looks a little strong right now, but don't worry. Once it starts drying, you'll see that it makes sense. Now I'm drying the brush and I'm trying to lift back some of these. You see the extra light areas above the topmost drop. Um, now it was a bit hard with the brush. So I just use a piece of uh, tissue that can really help as well because it just soaks back the paint. Uh, now I'm going to try and do as much as I can of this because this will help us establish the shape of the water's surface. Okay, it's really important. This part is really important. Um, and I'm going to do some wet and wet with a mix of both the blue because you get a little bit more blue up top uh, and just a bit of that brown. So you see I'm s it's it just starts to establish the very basic shapes of the ripples. The dark areas are actually a reflection well everything is a reflection in a way but the dark areas are a reflection of something else that's in front of the water it could be an element in the background it could be like an actual part of the view it could be a landscape it could be just um, a water like a, <laughs> probably not a cooler but it could be something more urban as well um, in an urban setting you can't really tell but Usually these dark areas are a strong reflection, while the rest is a manifestation of the light uh, on the water's surface. Again, it's really not a r rule or anything you can't tell, which is why it's so uh, effective to just detach from that and paint things as you see them. Okay, so I'm starting to get to a point where I'm pretty pleased with this initial wash. And again, it's not going to establish everything. Like this is just a very initial thing to get that very gentle feeling of ripples and I actually think and by the way there was some drying time sorry about that I let it dry and now I'm continuing with the next wash it's really amazing how um, the surface of the water is so complex as a three-dimensional shape because these ripples are essentially ring shaped uh, parts that are beveled above the water so you get a lot of rings that are beveled above they protrude from the water surface and that really affects how it looks and it's amazing that you can recreate that feeling with just color you know you just use color to recreate it and in a way you know it's not for it's not for no good reason that people say that I'm gonna flip that people say for a good reason that watercolor is good for painting water it is true a lot of the very smooth and gradual transition quality of water can be expressed really well with watercolor. And by the way, I love how water is portrayed in oils and acrylics. I'm real I'm all for it. I see a lot of these kinds of paintings that I absolutely love. However, with watercolor you can achieve some really amazing effects that I think otherwise would only be possible with uh, like programs like Photoshop or stuff like that. Um, obviously you can blend uh, with acrylics, with oils, you can blend. It's just not the same, okay? Uh, so now we're getting to uh, the ripple stage. Uh, I'm just putting it as I see it, uh, as much as I can. I I'm going to get less, uh, like fewer rings in, just because I should have probably raised the the upper drop and then the, all of the, the two drops should have raised them a bit and then I had more room for some more ripples, but that's fine. Because it's a repetitive pattern, we can tra change it up, okay? We can play around with it. Uh, and with these kinds of paintings, it really helps to have a good sharp tip for the brush if you want to get these small details in. If you don't have a good brush, I would actually recommend to just paint larger. I know it's it's funny uh, because people are intimidated by larger paintings, but it's actually easier. You have more room for error very often. So try working larger. Uh, it can actually work. You do need a larger brush. Now, just to give you an idea of the size, this is an Escoda brush from the green plein air set. Uh, this one is size six, 16 and my uh, sheet of paper is really small. You can see it's like five by five, maybe um, no, probably not. No, not even that. Hmm. You know what? That's interesting. I think it's like uh, hmm, probably 18 centimeters. So that's like, I don't know. I don't know how much it is, but it's really small. You can compare it to the size of my hand and I'm still working with a 16 size brush because I want to 
uh, have ease in filling in the spaces. I don't want to work with a tiny brush. Uh, generally, I find that a size 16 will be enough for me all the way up to a maybe A3 kind of size, uh, something around that. But if you go larger than A3, uh, it's going to get a bit harder to um, get all the details uh, you want in not get all the details, sorry, to cover up large areas um, of paint efficiently. Okay, at some point you have to use a larger brush or it'll just be uh, a nightmare, basically. Uh, so following the ripples from the inside now to the outside, you see there is one distinct, very wide, kind of concave shape ab above that. If you follow the drops down to the bottom, you get a dark section at the base of the drop pillar, I don't know what you call it. Then you have a bit of a light section and the dark section that I'm working on right now. This is a concave part, I assume, makes sense. Um, and this is why it's very strongly shaded. Uh, so I really love that. It's There's something so beautiful about water and I do want to improve my uh, skills at it. Uh, I believe uh, Marcos Beccari is his name. He does water really well. Is um, I hope I'm not confusing him with a different artist, but I believe it's Marcos Beccari, um, a uh, Br Portuguese or Brazilian. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at this. I should know. Um, but he does water insanely beautiful. It's really, really good. Uh, all of the ripples, including people that <laughs> bathe in the ocean, it's really realistic with the light. Uh, also underwater. Uh, these are all, I would say... It's the types of subject that take the medium to its uh, farthest edge. It's the types of uh, paintings that are the hardest uh, to execute. Um, they're also very impressive technically. I really like loose cityscapes and things like that, but it can really be impressive. Uh, now look at all these small rings. I would guess that these are the reflections of the water drops that are in the air, though I'm not sure. It looks like it. Uh, just follow the patterns you see. Uh, go zoom in on the picture, follow it slowly, work small area by small area by small area if you uh, have to, if you're scared to uh, lose sight of the overall impression, you know, um, really take your time with these kinds of things. I think I did a decent job here. Obviously, if I would paint larger, um, slower, not filming at the same time, it could help. Um, now, I'm just establishing a few darker spots here for these uh, the concave area. Uh, these are kind of optional. I don't see areas that are really... There's just one value and I made it a little lighter. So I'm just going back and darkening some spots, basically. Uh, that's it. Uh, you can leave it as it is. Uh, you can actually play with the values a lot. I know I always say if you get the values accurately, like Stan uh, always says, says Stan Miller. Uh, Stan Miller, yeah. Uh, like he always says, if you get the values right, you get the drawing right, you'll get a realistic effect. However, I would like to add to that that you can change the values. You can change quite a lot of them, <laughs> actually, and still get a, a result that resembles it. It's actually a good thing to try and practice. Make it lighter, see if you can play around with the colors or the shapes to create what you want. Uh, so here I go, just adding these small ripples. You see all of these small details add up, and eventually when you zoom out, it gives the right impression. So here we go, uh, removing the tape off of this one. I have to say I'm quite pleased with it, and in just a few moments I'm going to also zoom out, show you both paintings together, uh, and you will see how the impression is created. Okay, from afar, it, it, I think it's a little more impressive. So here we go, two quick ways of portraying water uh, in watercolor. You get these drops on the floor or on some kind of a surface and then water in a looser uh, kind of position. So uh, this is all about reversing the light and shadow again. A lot of the, it is the reflective qualities of it that change things around and distort reality. And I think that's what makes this a very nice subject to paint. Not necessarily my cup of tea. Uh, I did this one mainly because I was asked to. It's not necessarily the subject I'll go for because I personally find others more interesting. But if you like this, then these are the things you want to focus on. I want to thank you so much for watching. Now let's wrap it up face to face. So once again, thank you so much for joining me in this video. Again, this was following a request I got um, after the video I did showing the Mercedes logo uh, and that kind of chrome, chromic, uh, very reflective uh, surface. So here you get a very similar phenomenon in a way that is again dominated by strong contrast. So I hope you have benefited from this lesson. If you want to learn how to paint like me and how to let go, 
be free and enjoy the painting process be sure to check out my frustration free watercolor course link in the description box below <laughs> and with that i will see you again in the next video real soon